Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the sixth edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, I will just run through a couple of introductory slides here for anybody who is new to the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting series. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps and I'll be the host and moderator for this morning's meeting. Um, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, just an overview of the structure of this morning's webinar. We've got two companies presenting. We run these every fortnight uh, and it runs for an, kind of plus minus an hour. Each company gets 30 minutes, which is broken down to a 20 minute presentation from the company and then we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A. Please type any questions you have in the Q&A box below. Please don't type them into the chat function. Uh, the Q&A is the place for questions. I'll then try and get to as many questions as possible in the 10 minute Q&A section. And um, please note the webinar is being recorded uh, and it'll be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably by end of business day next Monday if you want to rewatch or um, check back on any particular slide that may have come up in the presentation this morning. Um, if you don't already follow Coffee Microcaps on social media, please follow us on Twitter at C Microcaps, uh, the YouTube channel for this recording and all previous recordings um, and obviously future recordings. Uh, you can also find us on LinkedIn where I do some kind of more additional long format content. So our two companies this morning, I'm delighted to say um, we have Shekel Brainway and the presenter is going to be Mr. Danny Nadri who's the country manager for Australia. And Danny's presentation is going to be followed by Yoji Limited, and I'm delighted to have Mr. Ed Clark, the CEO, joining us from Singapore to give us an overview of the Yoji business. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Mr. Danny Nadri from Shekel Brainway. Danny, I'm going to stop sharing now, and you can uh, start sharing the presentation on your side. Thank you, Mark. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Shekel Brainway uh, this morning to you. Uh, my name is Danny Nedry, and I'm the country manager for, uh, for the Shekel in Australia. Uh, really a, a unique microcap tech company that developed contactless uh, shopping technology. So, um, Quick overview of what we're going to talk about is basically to introduce the company and in particular the June update, uh, a little bit about the future and what we're looking at in terms of solutions for the future. Um, we're going to talk about the core business and that's something we'll go into some depth in explaining the differences between the two divisions. Uh, we really was hoping to do this whole roadshow somewhere in March of this year uh, because Sheka reports calendar year, so we ended our year uh, financially by the end of December 2019, uh, but we're not really able to do this. So we're very happy for the opportunity to do this uh, together with Coffee Microcap. So thank you, Mark, for the initiative and the ability to do this. Uh, so we're going to look at the financial results, but we're also going to give an update to the 1st of June in terms of our cash position. So uh, what is Shekel, really? Um, if you look at the bird's eye view, uh, you could say it's a technology innovator startup that underpinned by a very stable business. Uh, today, the business really sits on two pillars, two separate divisions altogether. One which is um, a division that has been around for over 35 years, uh, producing um, about 20, um, 27 million Aussie last year. A profitable division that sells to a very large clients around the world, uh, GE Healthcare being the largest single business uh, customer of the business. Uh, Toshiba, Fujitsu, and Atoms are others. Um, and a new technology venture altogether that started four years ago and was looking at the future of retail shopping and in particular uh, interest in autonomous shopping and started to bring uh, 
solution to this uh, venture, uh, to this whole idea, uh, as early as last year. Uh, and that's really the two different divisions that we're going to talk about. And while the, uh, the first one is uh, doing really well in terms of progressing, uh, the second one was mainly engaged with development for a few years. And last year was the major year of development and starting commercialization. Uh, when you look at the right hand side of the slides and just a few elements to it. So overall revenue for last year was about 27 million Aussie, 18.8 uh, .8 million US, uh, with a gross profit of 8.1 million. Cash on hand by the end of 2019 was 2.6 million US. And at, as of 1st of June 2020, we are at 1.8 million US. Uh, the business has about 180 employees, um, 110 of them or 20 are in Israel, uh, about 60 in China and the rest is around the world. Uh, Shekel is a global company. We operate in all the major markets in the world, including the US, Europe, uh, and Asia and recently in Australia. This slide really deals with what happened in the last few months and especially the impact of COVID. So I think the, the most important thing is probably the, the first box on the left. Uh, all our employees are um, healthy and their families are healthy. So we weren't at all um, affected uh, from a health perspective from the pandemic. So uh, we are all happy about it. The management had to take measures to assure business continuity. And as of March this year, had to uh, release 22% of the workforce, especially in Israel, uh, to unpaid leave. They were paid through the government. Uh, and as of March, April and May, uh, were aware, uh, out of the uh, offices and factory. And as of the 1st of June, uh, most of them returned to work. Uh, during this period, we also all had to take salary cuts and time off and um, in order to reduce the expenses of the business. And um, we're happy to say that uh, even during this period, uh, the employees were extremely resilient, supportive of the business and really behaving well. The, on the financial side, uh, the company really invested heavily in R&D in 2019, something that caused us to burn roughly 350,000 US a month. Uh, we've now moved into about $160,000 US a month, uh, which is a major reduction in our uh, burning of cash. Um, in terms of our supply chain, we see continuing, uh, there was a, a slight disruption in the beginning, uh, both in Israel and uh, in Hungary. Uh, but uh, as of uh, 1st of June, all the operation is back, back and running. So we don't see any problem with supply chain at that moment. We are receiving uh, orders even in April and May. Uh, so that goes to the demand side. Uh, we, um, all our major clients have continued their ordering system and we are uh, firm for uh, continuing supply for the remaining of the year. If at all, we could say that uh, we uh, try to go after this business, uh, after autonomous shopping in the past and um, really look to the future three years ago. And uh, what we saw during the COVID pandemic is mainly acceleration of the demand for autonomous uh, shopping. So we think that that's gonna be in a good, uh, in a good way going forward. I'm just mindful of the time. Um, so when we talk about future of autonomous store and what we bring to the market, uh, what you see from left to right are different solutions that the company now offer in order to allow retail to operate more autonomously. On the left hand side, you'll see our product Aware Bay, which is based on our technology that we developed. And we'll talk a bit more about this in, in, in a short while. And on the center, you'll see Innovendi and Sorter. These are two fridge-like and um, machines that allow consumer to interact uh, and buy products which are not normally a vending machine product. And we'll talk more about this. And our end game is really the capsule. It's a whole autonomous store, about 25 square meter shop uh, that allow consumers to basically enter through presenting a credit card or an employee card, take whatever they want from the shelves and just leave, uh, even uh, without a real uh, self checkout. And that's a cooperation we're doing together with Hitachi, a Japanese company, and the solution is undergoing a trial in Europe at the moment. So talking about really the market that the new division 
is looking to service um, is really to understand where the retail is going. And I think there's a, a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of research across the world. But what's interesting is really the idea that we're moving from hypermarkets and supermarkets and very large uh, units of sale into a smaller and smaller units. And uh, you, you see it in Australia where Woolworth move into the metro brand, which is a smaller shop and even to a smaller uh, shop uh, today that they call it Go, Metro Go, and uh, and in other, the, the same with calls as well. So we see this trend moving into a, a smaller and smaller unit of sale, and at the same time, you need to man this shop. So the less manning of a shop like this that you need, the more autonomous you make the shopping experience, the easiest it is on the on the retail to actually operate, and that's exactly the market we're going after. If you look at the roadmap for the product and what we are bringing to the market, we really started with the key component, which is understanding shelves. And we started by taking our core understanding in sensor technology, which is a weighing capability. We added a massive artificial intelligence and advanced mathematics to the process. And we created a technology that allows us to look at the shelf and understand exactly what moves on it. So if you take a pasta sauce, we know in, in real time and so on. We then put it into products. So the first one was a bay, a whole bay of a supermarket. And we're undergoing a trial in Australia at the moment with a major retail. Uh, and basically what we do is we uh, sell the, the equipment, the bay, and then we start charging on a fee, which is a SaaS model for every data collection that we do. At the same time, and in order not to wait to retail, we introduced to the market the InnoVendi. It's really an exciting vending machine by which a consumer come and he introduced himself through a credit card or an employee card. He opened a fridge door and he takes whatever he wants from the InnoVendi. That's really exciting because then you can put in products like salads and fresh food and dairy products and yogurts and things that you haven't seen in a vending until today. Uh, the machine started to operate in Israel. Eight machines were on the field within months. Uh, they suddenly found out that the revenue coming through these machines are much higher than your normal vending. The whole uh, psychic of consumer behavior is very different when people are buying from a fridge door. Uh, and really, the life of this product started with a bang, with a major order of 1,200 machines. We already delivered about 100 and some. And uh, this year, uh, in planning to deliver up to 300 more. And this product was the first one to start real commercialization uh, with products today available both in the UK, in the US, few uh, countries in Europe, and we have our first machine in Australia. Sauter is exactly the same product, uh, the same machine, only without the fridge. So for a high value item, a risky item, it was developed predominantly for a DIY retail chain in the US. And we think that there's gonna be the same type of demand. Uh, and, the, and again, we sell Innovendi for roughly, let's say, 10,000 Aussie. And from the moment that we sell it, uh, we start to charge on a monthly basis a SaaS model of the data collection that we provide to the vending machine operator. Uh, similar uh, with the sorter. The capsule is really the end game, uh, a mini store, if you will, a convenience store, completely autonomous. Uh, and that's undergoing a trial in Europe uh, with the plan to go into an airport soon. I think it's going to be too uh, time-wise, too difficult to go into uh, really going into what we consider to be shopping for zero, which is the future of shopping. I think that um, what what is important to understand is that this whole market is undergoing changes, and our product were built for these changes even before COVID. And during COVID, what we saw is an acceleration of this uh, demand for a more, uh, uh, say, autonomous play. A little bit about our traditional business, and Shekel has a, a traditional business for over 35 years, which was basically sensor technology. So we developed a very accurate technology for weighing stuff very accurately and fast. And these products are now implemented as an OEM devices in two major markets, one being the healthcare and the other one being the retail. On the healthcare side, if you'll see on the left-hand side of the bottom of the slide, you'll see a machine that uh, is a, really an incubator. And the other one next to it is a warmer, baby warmer. These are all machines that are used for premature babies, uh, which needs to be put in an incubator and a baby warmer. 
GE Healthcare is the largest single client of the of Shekel, and is also the larger, the, the biggest provider of these machines in the Western world. Uh, we sold about 10,000 units last year to the healthcare segment. Those weighing technology, weighing system goes into these incubators and warmers as an OEM device. Um, these are long-standing contracts every year, uh, and some of them have an exclusive uh, position to them with a minimum orders. Uh, very lucrative and uh, market that has not been negatively affected by COVID at all. On the right hand side, you'll see the Healthway, which are really Shekel branded product. If you'll see like chairs and so on, they're all based on weighing technology and they go to hospitals and um, uh, elderly care and uh, this type of uh, places. And um, uh, that's uh, another segment of the Healthway uh, healthcare business produced roughly two and a half million US uh, just this segment alone. In Australia, there is a distributor in Newcastle that sells a few hundred uh, thousand Aussie a year. Um, on the largest market segment, lar larger uh, uh, market segment is on the retail side. And what we do is we provide OEM devices, which weighing system that goes into a self checkout, exactly the checkout that you see in retail today. That when you do your own, there's a, a scale that verifies uh, what is it that you have scanned, and um, really, what uh, um, just just to make sure that we're not present in Australia in this uh, in this respect. Most of it is. Uh, a supplier that uh, is not working with Shekel, uh, but we work in others uh, like Walmart, like uh, Carrefour and others. And, uh, and really we provide the, the weighing technology to Toshiba and Fujitsu and people next to Datalogic and others. And they in turn sell the self-checkout to the retailers. Uh, so you don't see Shekel, but we are actually inside, almost like an Intel inside type solution uh, last year. About 30,000 systems like this were sold uh, to, to these giants. Uh, at the same time, we're in very close cooperation with Intel uh, and also with Deloitte, but Intel recently put us, put us on their system, on their website, uh, pro it's promoting our technology. Let's look a bit about the numbers, just to give a brief overview. Something to really understand is the milestone that were uh, reached in 2019, and people were asking, well, wh why are you in the reds at the end of the year? The reason is that the system, the company listed in 2018 on the Australian Stock Exchange in November, with the sole idea to support the new venture, which is the new technology venture that we started a few years before. And during 2019 was the major year of the growth. And by year of the growth, we, we mean something that was seven, eight engineers sitting in some bunker, if you will, turned into a whole division with the CEO, with about more than 20 employees, started commercialization, delivery of product, uh, putting operation in place and other uh, boxes, if you will, of the whole division. And with it started the acceleration of the commercial part of delivering trials. Uh, and we now have about four trials going aside from the Innoventi, uh, which is what we needed to go through in 2019. And that was the major part of the investment in the R&D. Uh, while at the same time on the right hand side, we continue to uh, push the scale division, the regular, the, our core division and, uh, and continue to gain clients. Uh, last year was in Sweden, Poland and the Netherlands. So when you look at numbers and we specifically wanted to put it in this uh, two, two pillar slides, but the overall side is 18.8 .8 million US with a gross profit of 8.2 million. The loss is mainly attributed to the heavy investment into the r and in the, of the new division. And the cash position was 2.6 million at the end of uh, December, 2019. Like I said, we're at a burn rate of about 160,000 US uh, monthly at the moment. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the numbers for shekel scale, uh, very profitable. To, a profitable division with 2 million US uh, on EBIT. Uh, and on the right hand side, what you see is the retail innovation platform, uh, which recorded zero sales. It's not really zero in, in the sense that we have delivered machines last year for the retail. The Innovendi was delivered, about 80, 90 machines were delivered in Israel and some in the UK. And they went into the field and we did receive money for them. But as we mentioned, due to some accounting rule, uh, these $290,000 could not be attributed as uh, 
sales, but was actually part of the R&D expense. So I guess that's accounting rules. Uh, the division did deliver equipment and received money, but couldn't record it as sales. Um, we're getting into numbers that I think would be wise for me personally not to go too much in detail, uh, but I think it's pretty much showing the difference between 19 and 18, pretty much the same revenue for the scale division and uh, starting of activity. Most of the um, expenses, if you will, or the, the contribution to the loss happens here on a major investment into the uh, R&D. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, similar here, it's about underlying cash operating expenses and, uh, and earning. Basically, uh, I think what we see is the FY19 EBITDA is actually positive at $600,000 US, but due to some non-cash expenses and financial expenses, we actually got to, to a loss. Um, regarding the balance sheet, uh, again, pretty much uh, similar explanations across the board in terms of cash and cash equivalent and uh, the rest of it, we you know happy to go into details in a different uh, form. But I think one thing that came up is this short-term loans, uh, which is the uh, the one that you see here, four four point one million US. And I think what what is really important to uh, uh, understand about uh, about this is that uh, the, the short-term loans. Is, is not really, is, is a entirely made of a short-term credit facility for managing working capital and to cover initial direct cost for materials. So it's basically not a loan that we took and we have to pay every month in a sense. It's most, mostly a credit facility uh, as a manufacturing uh, facility. Really just to end up in the, hope in the last minute, uh, is why to invest in Shekel, I would say three main points. Uh, one starts with the technology, really the taking of the a very superior capability in sensor technology, uh, adding the artificial intelligence to the mix and integrating the two really create a best in class solution that is ahead of any competition at this moment. Uh, even when we compete against optics, we show much higher results. And we think that the technology is what really going to take us uh, further into the future and separates us from any competition. Um, I think it's interesting to see what the management did here about three, four years ago. They were not complacent with taking $2 million home. They put all the profit back in the business and looked at the future of retail. And even though the business was profitable, decided to invest their own money in getting it done. And maybe the third one is the fact that you're really investing in a startup, which has an underpinned business, which is very stable. So unlike normal startup that you really risk a lot by not uh, uh, but if something goes bad, here you have a whole business to rely on uh, if, uh, if things get to be slower than what you anticipated. So really, we're looking at the future of retail shopping and big data assets. And we are uh, thinking that we are on a way, on a good way, progressing towards this, uh, this goal. Thank you so much. We're happy to take uh, any question. I think we did it right on time. Um, uh, thanks, Danny. Yeah, I'm going to just jump into questions here. We have have a couple. Um, one is, uh, can you state the the SaaS component? Um, I guess how much you charge on a monthly basis for the the SaaS component of the machines? Is it like you know, is it like a ten dollar a month per machine or a hundred dollar a month per machine? Or how does the the pricing work at I guess the customer level? The unit that we, we start with, I think, is about $7 US per shelf. So if you look at Innovendi, which would normally have five shelves, it's roughly 50 Aussie, if you will, a month, or uh, a, bit, a, bit, uh, uh, a bit more, depending on, on exchange rate. And it changes from a place to place. So if a store will take you know, thousands of shelves, it's very likely that we'll work out a price for a retail shop. So there's a unit that we start with, which is made mainly mainly a, a shelf, if you will, for the pricing. Uh, but then it gets to play uh, uh, solutions which uh, which are more elaborated. Um, we have received, for example, an order from Australia for ten in November uh, machines. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to put it on hold. It's not cancelled, but it's uh, on hold at the moment until. 
uh, things will get better in some offices, I guess. But, uh, but in this case, we worked out a solution because if somebody operates a thousand machines in Australia, a thousand vending machines, there will be a different price. Uh, but the SaaS model is inherent in what we're going to do. And that's really exciting to see. We used to sell in terms of one, ta one, one off sales, uh, a certain weighing system. And uh, now the, the business moves into a SaaS model by which we'll have recurring uh, business coming in. It's also interesting from uh, what, what appears now on the, on the slide. If Shekel will be in a position to collect data rather than just sell products, our ability to then collect a lot of data from a lot of shelves of a lot of supermarkets and apply business intelligence to the data puts us more as a data company. I think you see it on this slide at the end. So our ability in the future to collect a lot of data points of people interact with products on shelves is something that would uh, allow us much better understanding of how people shop and uh, add um, commercial intelligence to it. Okay, and then just when you mentioned Innovendi, I know you said um, um, a lot of the machines have been rolled out in Israel. Um, the question is, when do you think uh, you know a hundred percent of the current orders will be will be rolled out? Is it a, a, a twelve months from here or eighteen months from here? Oh uh, no, we we have announced this deal back in February two thousand and nineteen. Mm -hmm. Originally, Nuva, which is the largest dairy company in Israel, which is also another interesting point to this uh, whole order, uh, was looking to take 1,200 machine, after they took eight, the 1,200 machine over seven years with uh, a minimum of 100 machine per year. They have since then changed and this year already they want 300 uh, machines. So we believe that within three years we'll complete this order. Uh, we had to scale up production in Hungary and, uh, and that was, um, that took a few months to bring it up to scale. But we think that this particular order will be completed within three years. Uh, that doesn't stop us, by the way, from delivering in other territories. So as of end of last year, we have delivered already in the UK uh, and, and, that, and, and in the US. So um, while we're continuing to do what the, what's needed to deliver these machines, uh, we can, uh, we continue to deliver others. What's interesting about Nuva, by the way, is that it's not your usual suspect, so to speak. So we thought originally to go after vending machine operators. Nuva is a CPG, is a food manufacturer. And it was interesting to see a dairy company that decided to approach the market directly, almost like A2 milk, starting to sell directly to the clients in train station and mainly offices, buildings, and so on, and put their faith, if you will, in their own hands instead of in the retail hands and started to sell products themselves. And they saw a significant rise in product sales for these machines uh, relative to what you would normally expect from a vending. Uh, and that's, I think, an interesting market to go after, very large food manufacturers that will decide to uh, sell directly to the market. I don't know if we have a chance to show this movie about the inner vending, which is nice, but we were not able to run it. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you you know if people just search Inno Vendi on YouTube, there is a good movie uh, that explains how the system works. We have uh, launched, starting to launch our campaign in Australia. Uh, we did a quick webinar, and we're going to do another webinar about the Inno Vendi this month, uh, uh, going after about 150 vending machine operators in Australia uh, that run similar machines. Some run over 1,500 machines. Okay. Um, Danny, one quick last question before I hand over to Ed, our next presenter. Um, what's the underlying kind of growth outlook for the traditional scales business? Uh, so I think we, we need to be careful um, not to put any guidance, uh, but um, clearly to, to we, we could go after the the, we, we can put, start from explaining what the research shows. So the business of um, self-checkout, what you see today in Woolies and Coles, is to grow in about 12% annually uh, over the next few years. So what you see basically, if you remember, if you'd go into a supermarket a few years ago, there would be six, seven manned point of sale and maybe two self-checkout. Now you see a lot more 
checkout, uh, self-checkout systems. That's where we participate. So in a sense, we enjoy this growth in about 10% annually, uh, but it can explode because we see now these machines going into um, Bunnings and people which are not grocery retail. By the way, another segment of the market that we serve that were not negatively affected by, uh, by the COVID was the grocery retail and even the DIY shops. So when this self-checkout will come into play with other retail players, we have a bigger chance to participate in this growth. We hard, to be honest, we hardly affect this growth. So we, we don't really impact how Toshiba sells their machines, but we basically provide good equipment to them. And when that happens, we are happy to, uh, to grow. So it's about 10% annually is what we see across the, across the board. Okay. All right, Danny. Um, listen, thank you very much for the the um, presentation, and I'd like to now ask you to stop sharing your screen, and we'll um, pass over to our next presenter, Ed Clark. Uh, so, thank you so much for this opportunity, and uh, looking forward to uh, um, see the response of the people. So, thank you again. Uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Okay, thank you, Danny. And Ed is flying in here. Um, Ed, I can confirm, I can see the uh, cover page of your presentation. Very good. So hi, everyone. Um, introducing here, uh, Ed Clark from Yoji. I'm the managing director and co-founder of Yoji. Uh, Yoji is about a four and a half year old uh, company. Uh, we've really focused on supply chain uh, as a, as a business and looking at using software as a service technology, cloud-based technology to work with companies trying to solve the new problems in supply chain. And everyone has become aware of them, I think, since COVID, where you've got um, very large numbers of jobs now or work now being done all the way to the consumer home. And companies trying to get more robust and more distributed supply chains. So we started at solving this problem about four and a half years ago, and we're quite uh, unique in the way we approach the problem. And so I'll introduce that, uh, share a little bit, a bit, bit about Yoji, and, and talk about um, who we're working with and where we're heading. So as a business. Um, we really focus on solving three pillars in logistics and that is visibility, uh, accountability and control. And that is relevant for everyone across supply chain. I'm sure people listening and um, can all relate to the visibility problem where people are waiting for things to arrive and they're not sure when things are coming. A lot of that is a technology problem in the end to end supply chain where because there's no visibility over what's happening um, in real time, there's very poor um, planning capabilities and ability to work with people to, to give them an up, update on you know, are things on time, are they late, or more clear predictions on time windows. Accountability. Uh, in Australia, um, the market is extremely fragmented. Even though there's Toll and there's Lintbox, these types of groups, the top four or five logistics companies in, in Australia only are, own about 10% of the market and below that there's lots of SMEs and mum and dad businesses. So it's extremely fragmented. So it's about helping people work with their subcontractors and partners and create efficient networks, um, which has been really a standout capability of ours and helped us gain some really interesting customers. And the final piece is control. So obviously cost management, time to getting paid, these types of things. So giving businesses uh, much better control over their supply chain and helping even our customers, customers who would be the shipper or the manufacturer, getting even better control over their supply chains to improve margins. So a couple of the things we do, giving you some examples of areas we work. So manage, track and integrate. So we'll work with all the different participants um, on all ends of the supply chain and we're solving problems in cross-border shipping, which we'll talk about a bit more. Um, logistics networks where you've got three, four, five companies or more working together to solve um, network problems. Um, you know, so the multi-carrier use case. And we work closely with enterprise and SME. So here's an example um, on a page of, of how a supply chain works. And this is, I think, what some people don't see in, in the end-to-end -end piece. And sometimes we will get 
um, confused a little bit with some sort of startup last mile delivery technology. And you can see that sort of fits in, in a small part of the bottom left where you've got delivery from store or delivery from single warehouse. Um, whereas Yoji's really looking at how do you move 50,000, 100,000 parcels or um, units through a supply chain in, in the manner that's presented here. So a lot of times there'll be cross border, there'll be a first mile, there'll be a pickup, you'll often be loading pallets into containers, moving containers across border, moving containers out of ports into cust through, after customs and moving them into warehouses or what we call cross docks and then delivering last mile, whether that be to a business or an individual. So this is really um, essentially what Amazon does as well, if you look at this process, this is their end-to-end -end process, and this is what we're trying to solve for everyone else. Um, and why this is important is that that milestone capability that people are asking for, um, you know, when you, when you log on, you want to know where things are, is very difficult with legacy technology to achieve. And real efficiency, when we're talking about AI, route optimization, planning, um, and cost management is really difficult to achieve through legacy systems. So we solve this end-to-end -end problem, problem. So we're very different um, to the last mile delivery technologies that people will sometimes confuse us with. Um, and what we're doing is solving problems which are of a much larger scale that um, require much more agile solutions. And that's due to the rise of things like e-commerce and contract logistics, which we'll talk about. Um, the system, is IoT ready, so we're very capable of integrating in you know, the IoT devices that roll through pallets and containers and track things through the supply chain. Um, we, we already support complex networks and multi-leg movements. Um, we already support subcontracted networks. Um, Cloud-based, which is really great. The system's already in about 10 languages. We can roll out languages very quickly, so it's ready for global scale, and that's required given the types of contracts we've been signing. Um, over the last few months. Uh, the platform, giving a bit more information here. So it's all login and play. Um, it will manage everything out of a single interface, which is uh, super easy to use. So it's really, really powerful, giving logistics users time back in their day, reducing the number of people that need to manage um, for these processes because they can do it all out of a single laptop wherever they are in the world. Um, so some of the key things, the features, um, track and trace, route schedule optimization and ETA. So we can get um, real time and, and updating ETAs, which if our customers chose to, they could share with their customers. So you could get almost to the minute estimation of delivery at an e-commerce level if, if that was something our customers wanted to offer. We can automate a lot of the business processes so we can actually help clients settle their business rules and automate all of the, the back office piece for logistics, which is, provides huge efficiencies in terms of um, dispatches, man hours and costs associated there. We provide really interesting actionable data and, and, and control towers. So what that means is that very large contracts, and I'll talk about contract logistics, they can provide real-time dashboards to, to their customers. So for example, you could sign Bunnings as a customer, you could go to them and say, look, we're gonna give you a real-time dashboard so you can have, you can see all of the, the, everything moving through your network, you can see what's on time, what's at risk, what's late, um, you know, what the before SLAs are, all these types of things in real time, which is super powerful. So getting back into the three pillars that I mentioned, um, we really focus on these three things and this is a reason we're starting to win uh, large multinational clients. Um, we've, we have signed two of the top 10 um, 3PL forwarders in the world in um, Kuna Naga, with who's ranked number two and Geodis who's in the top 10. Um, the key things that whether you're a mum and dad business or a multinational, you're trying to get an unobstructed view across your supply chain to meet demand with real-time information. You're trying to get the confidence in your subcontractors and vendors that people are delivering the value that they're promising and doing it within the SLAs that you're working with because obviously you want to maintain those contracts and that's critical. So, you know, prior to us, the only way to manage subcontractors is essentially to either pick up the phone and try and call and find out what's going on with no visibility or just hope that nothing goes wrong. And obviously SLAs can affect your total contract. 
So it's really important and now people are pushing more and more to get visibility into the at the subcontractor level and control. So the ability to make intelligent business decisions in real time. So it's optimization at an optimization and planning level. It's which of my vehicles should I use to get the most cost efficient outcome, but also which subcontractor should I use to get the most efficient outcome. And that can be at a group a group of jobs level, it can be at a single job level. And it's really important you get that because when you're in an industry with a margin of about 5%, uh, it's critical that you're making good decisions all the time. So giving an example here, this is how um, contract logistics works and all of the players across an end-to-end -end supply chain. And this is particularly relevant for um, where contract logistics ha has take, picked up, but also what's required in e-commerce. So that central box um, is what we'd call freight forwarding. And that has been typically how the big companies in the industry have been freight forwarders and they, they've I've got a lot of volume and essentially manage the, um, the cross-border piece. So the, the warehouse cross-docking and customs has been really the big component owned by the big players. But now you can see with the red boxes moving out end-to-end, -end, what's happening uh, is contract logistics, which is represented there. And that's for two reasons. Uh, contract logistics is a much higher margin activity than freight forwarding. It creates much longer contracts and makes, creates makes you much more sticky with with the customer so for example if you're we know with customers working with um, say Apple or Nike around the world we'll be doing value-added activities like reverse logistics maybe repairs maybe you know, warranty work um, working with the stores so people are moving further up and down the supply chain and, and managing more pieces of the supply chain which means you need a, need a much different technology than that's been around in the past so through this, um, we, we help companies achieve that end-to-end -end capability where you're going everywhere from the first time that from the manufacturing place of the item all the way through to the last mile delivery in a controlled and single system manner. Um, so some of the sectors that, that are working in this space, uh, you've got you know, the, the general shipper space, people just moving things across networks. You've got omni-channel. So now you're starting to see, and I noticed there was a speaker before looking at the retail space. You've got things like um, omni-channel where you've got e-commerce, you've got in-store purchasing, often stores now offering in-store um, to home delivery. So you don't have to carry things home. And that's especially prevalent in Asia where a lot of people don't own cars. Um, so you're looking at people that are setting up multi-faceted uh, retail networks where you can buy online, you can buy in store, or you can go to what's called an endless aisle concept and buy things in store and get it delivered to home from a warehouse. So that's all different um, logistics methods, but it's all tied into a single experience, which we help with. Um, financial services is very time critical. Parcels, documents, checks, still very prevalent in Asia. Food and beverage, automotive, cold chain, um, some of the big areas we're also working with, um, ports and containers. So, uh, you know, for example, a WiseTech type system is helping people with the administration and customs clearance and GST and all the, the, um, the administration side of things. But once that item is cleared for movement, a system like ours will pick, pick things up um, and start to manage and plan the physical movement as, as opposed to the administration side. So we're quite complementary um, to a product like the WiseTech um, CargoWise solution. And we have many customers that are using CargoWise um, in their business and integrate and use us integrated into that system so that they can have a seamless experience. Um, moving forward, uh, I've talked a bit about contract logistics. This is an area where we're winning a lot of customers. So as I mentioned before, we've got two of the top 10 global forwarders as customers, which, which are very large opportunities because you can see through this image here, I mean, this is the fastest growing and often largest part of a, a large um, 3PLs business where they're servicing very specific contracts in a specific way. Uh, and they need agile cloud-based solutions to deliver on them. And the legacy solutions were never built for that type of thing and they weren't built for, for e-commerce. And you can see down here, um, Yoji is a business. We've got multi-year contracts with two of the top 10. 
and we've got advanced discussions with a number more. And that, that's really exciting because these, these are groups with um, 10, 20, $30 billion in annual revenue where contract logistics may be um, six to $10 billion per company of, of their revenue. Um, so there's huge opportunities within the accounts we've sold and huge transactional volumes, which is the way we build. So we're really working hard in those existing clients. Um, you know, we've had some, some really good success there and we've got some really good um, pipeline ahead of us. So moving forward to explain the revenue model, um, we charge a setup fee, which includes your sort of professional services and training. Typically that's not a long process for an SME that could be as a number in the order of a couple of days. Multinationals obviously will be longer and that's charged appropriately. We then charge a subscription fee. So the subscription fee for an SME, you're looking at 400 to $1,500 plus US a month. Um, multinationals, you're looking at um, around $1,500 to $4,000 plus per hub um, per month. And then we're looking at um, transaction fees. And our sort of retail rate, which we predominantly maintain, is um, $0.20 cents per parcel, $0.40 cents per pallet, and $1.20 per container in um, sort of the, the developed countries. So to give you an example of um, clients, it's our, our top top number of clients, they have some customers alone, which in their network are doing hundreds of thousands of movements a month. So there's huge opportunity in that transactional space for us. We're providing a lot of value at that pricing level by giving them all of the visibility, accountability, control that's priced against, priced within their profit model. So it fits in nicely with the way our customers charge per movement. Um, they can factor in our costs and maintain their profit margins really well and actually obviously increase their profit margins by taking people off the floor, the floor for planning and uh, management and financial administration because it's all digitised um, and, and also improve visibility and pick up more clients because they have a, a more modern model. And the way that we work and the integrations we do means that we really are geared towards long-term commercial relationships and sustainable um, sustainable deployment so you know we see these large clients as being 5 10 15 year growth models because of the way that we can integrate value add and continue to work with them on solving their most difficult problems um, and helping them achieve what they want to achieve with their clients and, and that's been a really key thing of what we've been doing with our large existing clients um, so an example here um, China's Belt and Road this is a really good example of what's happening. So container movements are happening out of China into Asia already. Um, it's the, the land bridge um, and from Singapore and Malaysia across Asia. So you're seeing a lot more trucking because air freight capacity, specifically for e-commerce and contract logistics, is essentially run out of air, air, air freight capacity. So you can ship things by truck across border from China into Asia or from Singapore and Malaysia across Asia. You're only sometimes losing less than a day or a couple of days by doing trucking over air. But a trucking is, is essentially the same cost as shipping, but almost the speed of air. So it's a much more efficient way through Southeast Asia. Um, in Southeast Asia, the logistics industry, so Asia's almost 60% of the world's logistics market. We're quite uniquely positioned here in the solution that we offer for Southeast Asia and Asia specific problems. Um, and that's why we've been very successful with these top 10 global companies. Um, Asia, as you can see here, the most, the, the largest market, but probably the least mature in terms of um, digital maturity. So there is a huge opportunity um, in the region where we're working quite uniquely, probably the people that would be seen as our competitors uh, predominantly either in Europe or North America that are trying to solve very, very different problems and often is not fit for purpose in Asia. So we're uniquely positioned in the world's biggest market um, and it's a very, very hungry market for transformation because of the rise of e-commerce in, in Asia and you know, due to guys like uh, Alibaba and Lazada. Um, and then the desire from the manufacturers. So just about anyone, any brand name is manufacturing in some way in Asia and they're demanding through the tenders and things that they put out to logistics companies that they, 
digital um, control tower visibility that I talked about before is there. So it's a huge opportunity for us. We're already, you know, for, for our age, we're already really well advanced into achieving um, customers that most companies our size and age would only dream of. Um, we're in an execution phase. We've got really good partnerships with these companies that are helping not only grow our, our revenue and cash flow position, but also to improve continue to improve our product with the best in the world guiding us on on best practice of logistics so really exciting time for us um, and on that note I'll start to move things towards questions mark okay thanks Sid um, just if we can go back to that prior slide um, a question around your competitors I know you mentioned guys in the same space but maybe in the products that are not fit for the Asian market if we were to you know go and look at um, competitors if we want to call them that for you guys in Europe or North America what would be like some examples and names uh, yeah so in terms of I mean a lot of people try and look at competitors to us in terms of last mile delivery um, so there are examples of the Israeli group Bring in India, you've got Logi Next, um, but these guys are only solving a very small part. And if you remember the, so the second or third slide I showed with that end-to-end -end supply chain, you know, they're solving one-tenth of that problem and not the end-to-end -end piece, including subcontractors. So what the multinational groups are telling us and the reason we're winning these contracts is that we're the only group that we, that we can find, that they can find that solves the end-to-end -end multi leg piece um, and then in Asia that's very important for example e-commerce in Indonesia 250 million people 70% of movements are outside of Jakarta so you know already there's more than one leg for the delivery so solving multi leg working seamlessly with subcontractors and doing optimization within the, the, the product so that's three unique things that solves the well, solves global problems really well but Asian problems specifically where you've also got look, borders you've also got complex logistics models that really don't exist in North America or Europe. Um, so then really, if you move away, you, if you accept that we're not a delivery product, last mile delivery only product, you then start to look at Oracle's and um, Mercury Gate and Red Prairie, which are very large heavyweight enterprise solutions. But they're really challenged at contract logistics where you're trying to solve particular problems specific, and in specific deployments for customers. So for example, um, Nike would have a, a very different SLA notification and milestone expectation to um, Apple and therefore you need to have a fairly specific deployment of the product slightly configured um, so that you can tailor to those types of things and have a, a group of people dedicated to running the system for that use case and we can do that in a matter of days and deploy that type of reconfiguration, whereas the legacy systems are not really built for that customer-specific management. Okay, and then just a couple of questions around um, revenue. Um, cash receipts were down 36% in uh, Q320. Um, if you can just address that, and then I'll follow up with the, the second revenue question after that. Yeah, look, it's a good question. I mean, logistics is a... In industry, and we, some of the problems we are mentioned we're solving is obviously is cash flow. Um, cash flow, it's a sensitive industry for cash flow. So when COVID hit, COVID hit um, there, there's a large part of it was just the slowdown of things because that was the initial phase of, of COVID hitting across Asia. Um, and, and other parts are us moving to towards the very, really focusing on the very large customers. And, um, you know, you saw us in the same quarter uh, announce uh, Kuna Nagel, who's a top two in the world. Um, so we, we've signed a global master services agreement. We've got an initial project um, rolling out with them, going live in, in coming weeks. So we're really focusing on solving those enterprise problems. Um, you know, and that's uh, one thing people probably are trying to understand it with our company is where are we in that stage of maturity? There's been lots of big, big projects before. Um, we've, we've been really, really good in building ourselves to a position where we can take on these multinationals because these are multi-million dollar uh, customer opportunities um, as, as we continue to, per year, as we continue to execute. So we're really trying to continue to build, um, which we have done and we've achieved building away from just being a last mile company over, over the last couple of years and matured. Um, we're now bringing on these large customers and that's when that transactional revenue starts to flow. So some of our big deployments with, 
Um, other multinationals obviously slowed down a little bit because of um, COVID, which uh, was unfortunate, but that'll pick, that will all pick up over coming weeks and months as well. So whilst it was a, a bit of a drop, um, we're not overly concerned about where, where we sit and we're really excited about the coming months and quarters. So then just on the revenue split, Ed, um, how much of your revenue currently is SaaS based versus the transactional piece? And, you know, where should that kind of land up uh, in time? Should, you know, the bulky revenue be SaaS revenue or should the bulk of the revenue be coming from the transactional piece? Yeah, look, transactional, the transactional piece is going to be the, the really big piece moving forward. You know, as we were working on these um, bigger customers, we I really see that going to sort of 50%, 60%, 70% of, of the revenue. So there's within the existing clients that people are aware of, there's, there's lots of revenue growth ahead. And that's going to predominantly be grown from the transactional um, revenue. That's our, our big focus as a business is to continue that transactional piece. It's, the margins are great on obviously subscription and transaction revenue, but we see that huge growth in transactional revenue as we start to see customers moving large volumes through our network. And often I think what people miss is that when we roll out that network effect, each time that a, an item is moved, whether it be a container, a pallet or a parcel, each movement is a transaction. It's not just one, one parcel is one transaction, which is um, the more traditional way, but we can really, pick up um, multi, multiple transactions from single parcels by value adding across the supply chain. Okay, and then another one you talk about, you know, you're um, targeting, you know, SME customers as well as, you know, the big guys like Kuhn and Agil. They're quite different sales channels and, you know, I guess different engagements. How are you managing, you know, to be, able to market to the SME guys as well as you know do these large enterprise deals like what does the sales funnel and um, process look for both of them yeah look it's a really good question uh, what we do is we segment essentially our SME sales is done by our field sales team and um, digital marketing team so that's all um, you know Google Google advertising, Facebook advertising, LinkedIn advertising and blogging and these types of things. So that's that more transactional sale, digital sales, that pure high growth sort of SaaS um, model, which is done from, it, from, from those teams. What's been really interesting is that was initially the problem we really went out to solve. But what happened is by solving that network piece, the enterprises really started to come to us and say, well, this really helps us because we've got all these subcontractors we want to work with too and we want visibility past our own warehouse so that's when we really got the pickup of enterprise clients and we've now spoken to just about all of them um, and sort of shared we've got either contracts or advanced discussions with a large number of them so that's the really exciting thing that although they're different sales cycles and you know an SME can be anything from one week to, to six weeks um, but the on the multinational side you've got the um, Longer sales cycles, which is managed by our executives. Great. Um, Ed, we're a, a minute or two from, from 10 o'clock, so I think we'll um, wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And if anybody has further questions or wants to, should they reach out to you or reach out to Glenn? Uh, yeah, they can reach out to Glenn or investor at yoji.com and we can we can share that okay great and this your presentation went up on the asx announcements platform this morning i think is correct, correct. correct. yeah so if anybody wants to download the presentation um, i do believe it is on the asx i think i had a quick look there while you were while you were talking okay on that note i'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the sixth edition of the coffee microcaps morning me i'd like to say thank you to danny nadri uh, our first presenter and to Mr. Ed Clark, our second presenter. And I will be in touch in due course about um, Coffee Microcaps, the seventh event um, next week sometime. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day.